Welcome everybody for tonight's Dharma talk. Thank you very much for Ron's introductory. And I do appreciate everything he said because it's a natural process from just living an average life and then finding the path. So let us have our question and answer session in a way that will reflect everything that you are interested in. So feel free to ask any questions you like. If I want to attain the mind which is clear as space, clear like a mirror, then uh, I should lose I, my, me. That means uh, not to want, not to hold, not to attach. Um, but sometimes I do want things. And the area that I find it the most uh, difficult is uh, regarding life and death. Because uh, I do want uh, myself to be alive, my the people that I love to be alive. So I find it uh, difficult. Why do you wake up every day? I don't know. <laughs> Good question. Then life and death has control over you. Of course. If you know why you wake up and why you live your life, then this moment is complete. The problem is not with wanting or even desire, okay? Or a little bit of resentment. It's our immune system working, okay? It's our big membrane of the self. If it becomes a wall, then greed and anger appear, and that's a problem. Mm. But if we are totally without any positive or negative responses in the world, not in the temple, then uh, we are really at the mercy of the universe, and very few of us can afford that. So, your I, my, me is not a problem if you know where it comes from and where it goes. And it accepts other selves, other persons, other groups, just as you accept yourself. So if we don't understand what we are made of, then we cannot connect to the world. And we don't understand what others are made of. What is our self? How it manifests as our true nature? So why are you alive? This is the question. Only for yourself or maybe for your cat or cats and your companion and your project and your society and maybe for all beings. It's not a big thing to say. If it doesn't limit just to yourself, then it has a bigger job than just being selfish. So I wouldn't worry about uh, the motivation. Keep the direction clear. Motivation comes from your past. Direction outlines the future, the purpose. We bring so many kinds of karma here. Some karma terrible, some karma better. Okay, not so much suffering. Either way, what is it that makes us decide, wake up and help all beings? That's our teacher. And that teacher you should find. And if you did, it definitely makes you go beyond yourself. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. For a long time, I'm sitting with uh, who am I? When I came here, I decided to, to sit with what is this? Much better. Yeah. You have two problems less, the who and the I. G good job. Okay. Continue. And yesterday, when we spoke, you told me to sit with the mantra. And, it, and like I said, it's the greatest. But what is the right thing to do and when? When somebody tells you to sit with the mantra, 100% do the mantra. <laughs> when somebody tells you 100% sit with the question, then just sit with the question. Good soldier. <laughs> Wins the war. Okay? No, so seriously, sometimes the mind has various karmic manifestations, like somebody has very strong emotional imbalance. The question is not enough, doesn't even touch it. It's like just click clacking the tip of the iceberg, like the bird's beak. To take away the iceberg, you have to start with the warm sea current. We have many of that north and south these days. And that warm sea current is the mantra that starts to go into your subconscious and starts to clean up. And then the manifesting emotions, they change. 
What's brilliant about Buddhist practice is that it doesn't really modify your conscious personality, at least some of them. Do not modify your conscious personality willfully. It goes directly to your subconscious and your conscious personality just eats, just walks, just talks, just works. No disturbance, no interference. This is not a battlefield of Dharma and Karma. But what you do as your practice goes directly to your subconscious and start to keep up the good work of being present, being less dualistic, and psychologically speaking, cleans up your archetypal reality. In Zen style of explanation, we say it cleans up your storehouse consciousness and the seventh, the decision maker, distinguishing consciousness, and the sixth, the let's say conceptual mind. But the sixth is not just an Excel chart or a you know word processor. The sixth is where the name and the form meet. When somebody's thinking gets weaker, maybe they recognize your face, they met you, but they can't put the name to your face again because that part of the memory, the processing is getting weaker. So mantra or correct Zen practice cleans up your subconscious and then the six, seven, eight, they are very harmoniously united and functioning together. So when you have any kind of deep emotional karma, a mantra is the best. And bowing, which you already know. When things are okay and you're sitting in a monastery, maybe as a monk, no hair, no wife, no children, who knows? So, <laughs> then maybe the question is enough. The what is this question is enough. All right? But those folks who do that, for several years, they did a lot of bows and a lot of mantras to get there so that they're not haunted by their own shadows and ghosts and whatever they have in their, in their alaya vijnana. So they can sit in peace. Okay? So that's why sometimes we change the practice to address and alleviate the karma that you actually have. Okay? I wanted to ask, when you come back from nirvana into a new reincarnation, does that mean you have to do the struggle of waking up again each time? Ask me when I come back from nirvana. <laughs> I'll be happy to tell you about it, but so far only mom and dad, that's what I can tell you about. So your question is a little theoretical, but what is clear that even the greatest masters, those who brought up the highest quality of mind in themselves, in one lifetime, they had to practice really hard. So just observe how the great teachers of humanity from 2,500 years ago until now, how they lived the highest still needed practice that almost killed them. That tells you about the difficulties. They had the quality. Some people practiced just as hard as they did and they didn't get not even near. Why? Because they didn't bring up that starting kit that Buddha, Jesus, Lao Tzu, Patanjali, Confucius, Saint Francis of Assisi or Bodhidharma brought down. Not to mention Sri Ramana Maharishi and other folks of his quality. So hard practice is fantastic. But it's also clear what we bring down and what is becoming clear by hard practice. So don't check karma. Just become clear and then lifetime after lifetime Bodhisattva path. All right? Thank you. You're welcome. So if we talk about karma, what we are now is what we did. It's the past and the future. What you are doing right now. Yeah. That's what you are. Yeah. What you did in the past is irrelevant. Yeah, but sometimes the inner child or the memories, when we practice, when we see how karma or are impulsive, shine up. Originally nothing, don't make inner child or inner adult or demons or gods or Buddhas. Remember the original, meet Buddha, kill Buddha. 
Very important. Don't make anything. So any kind of discipline, science or system is good, but the premises, the axioms, the presuppositions, they pretty much define how they work later. Don't make anything. Perceive. So that's why six patriarchs said, originally nothing. That's why Bodhidharma says, no holiness, only vast, empty space. Return to that. And everything's clear. So don't even love him, hug him. Don't do anything about these uh, memories that shine up. Inner child? Yeah, don't Make do anything. Make it outer child. You have three, so maybe a fourth <laughs> will be necessary. You love your kids. I've seen how you live. Come on. <laughs> So why ask me this question? Don't, don't feel sorry for yourself. That's the bottom line, all right? Sometimes when uh, you are propounded with this concept, you know, the inner chat, we suddenly start to feel sorry for ourselves right away. How useful is that? So only come back to this moment. It's Just come back to this moment without making anything. That's good, okay? Do you have to be an adult or a child to see that the floor is brown? So when these uh, me uh, memories are like making, when it comes up, it's like make we're making it. It's a spontaneous appearance of compounded karma. You know the drill. Yeah. It's Buddhism. It's all the firewood comes together. The kindling is lit. There's fire. That's how karma appears. That's how the notion of self appears. You pull the firewood a little bit more apart, then the flame goes down. The sense of self is not too strong. Even more apart, it's gone. So that's why we call it, it's, it's warm, it can burn, but it's illusory. So it's the same thing with anything inside. That's why at first this Zen type of teaching can seem to be really harsh. Don't make, don't hold, don't attach, don't want, don't check, okay? It's the hardest. So, don't make anything. Just stay clear. So my question is about uh, how to transcend the karma, like r real time, like life. If I see my karma during meditation, for example, I sit, we sit in meditation and... It I, sounds really good, how to transcend my karma real time. So how do you make your karma <laughs> yeah, real like time? How to so uh, act in, if I see this uh, movement of, uh, I don't know if it's ego, karma, but if the I see moment that I you identify with it, it becomes ego. The moment you detach from it, it becomes an asset. Okay? Asset? Asset, not a burden. So real time, watch your mind. Mm -hmm. Do you identify with your karma or not? Do you make dualities or not? Do you believe your own movie or not? That's how you transcend it. If you transcend it, you can use it. That's the surefire feedback. If your karma uses you, you haven't transcended it. Done. Then you, you take the circle, come back to the original point again, when you can sit, and you don't have to act it out, you don't have to speak it, think it, or feel it, and then you have another chance of transcending it. It will come back. Short or long distance, it will come back. So if I'm sitting now and I see this movement and I said, okay, it's, it's a thought passing by in the river, in the stream, I'm not attaching to it, I'm far from it so and then it's it will come back and come back and come back and the thoughts are always coming back so this is the movement all the time just to be try to be far from it to be it's not a matter of distance it's a matter of attitude or relationship do not react to your karma the hardest thing is not to try to fix your karma once you see what you're carrying you feel pretty shitty about it, you may try to fix it. Don't fix it. By looking at it with a non-dualistic, clear mind, that fixes it. Okay? So do not react to your karma, neither emotionally, nor cognitively, nor verbally, least of all should you act it out. That's why we say, not moving body, not moving speech, not moving mind. That's why we keep silence. It's not my hobby to shut you up. 
But when you practice, you better be silent also towards each other. You reduce your reactive mind to a minimum. And when you sit, to none. And that's how you cleanse your karma, because you stop making reactions, you stop making dualities, you stop identifying with it. You stop putting energy into it. And then you have a fairly good chance that if it comes back, it's in a different form. And then you still don't believe it and you still don't identify with it. And then it doesn't come back at all. And when you really need it, that's when it appears for the duration of the necessity and then it's gone. That's intuitive. That's spontaneous. That's selfless. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. First of all, I miss the Zen stick. Why doesn't we practice with a Zen stick here? No, you miss the, this? With this, with the... Mm -hmm. You mean the walking stick, the yeah. Kyosaku in Japanese. So, we stopped using it except the Yomen Jonjin, the intensive week, because people are afraid of it. <laughs> but they think that this guy is strict. He's going to punish me with that stick. <laughs> No, sweetie, this is not a punishment. Yeah. It's a relief from pain. But we don't really do that. Why? Because actually, no matter how hard you're practicing, two hours of sitting is not going to kill you. When you sit three or four hours just separated by walking meditation, that's hard. That's when they use the stick. That's why we use it only for the intensive week. If we get a popular request that sunim sunim, there's 23 people out of the 23 that is not afraid of the Zen stick and we would like you to use it. No problem. Can we make, can we, can we no. check? <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have uh, other ways of relieving this pain. Like uh, walking, like doing yoga exercises, which we thank Nati for. And uh, honestly, there's another aspect that if you have meditation where every 25 minutes during sitting somebody gets up, walks and makes some noise with the stick, not good, not bad, but if you can go without it, then it's better. But fear is an important factor. And I was shocked because honestly, I'm not the type that wants pain, but I was never afraid of this thing because it was clear what it was used for, even the first retreat. And when they hit you right, and the right muscles, it's you. Oh, thank you. Do it again. You know, so I can't wait for the next sitting. You know, it, just, it, it can but be that good. But then you get good. out from the meditation. Hmm? When it's, I can see the difference while we're sitting here without the Zen stick. Yeah. And while we're sitting with the, with the heating. Good. And I'm wondering, and now you, get me the, you give me the answer, but like 15 minutes of sitting without it, you pass the waves by yourself. You do. And if we do this right, folks, and there's not so much movement, not so much noise, and 50 minutes of sitting, especially in the second half of the day or early morning, is like blessing. That kind of presence, that kind of clarity, that kind of focus, when you put everything together by 30, 40 people, that's awesome. No noise, no distraction, nobody breaking it halfway. So do it, try. Then we have something. The Heart Sutra we chant in many different languages because we understand. The Great Dharani we chant only in Korean. Uh, it's not even Korean. It's, a, it's, a it's actually Siddham Sanskrit with some Korean Kochu Chang if on you're top Korean, of it, okay? do you understand it? So first, this no, they first don't. Thing. They don't. In fact, if you don't understand Sanskrit and some tradition, um, you don't understand the great Dharani, but it works even without it. You yeah. know? Do you understand hummus? I don't. I just eat it. <laughs> I also don't understand falafel or trina. But it's fantastic. Okay. So the Dharanis... They are from a really strong Hindu, Hindustani origin. Okay? So Nilakanta Dharani literally means the blue-necked Dharani or the Dharani, the mantra of the blue-necked one. 
and it was Shiva. It's clear, you know, the whole myth says that Shiva swallowed the entire world ocean to purify it from the poison. And through that purification, his neck became blue because the poison became visible there. But the world ocean became pure by that selfless act. And uh, Dharanis are supposed to give you protection, remove hindrances, give you energy, give you this mystical universal experience of oneness. But if you look at the Mahayana Dharanis, not just this one, but the Shurangama as well, which is the Pratyangiram Dharani, it is purely from Vedanta and Hindu origin. And then I uh, looked at it and I said, how did this enter Mahayana Buddhism? Well, those guys were no small players either. They said, well, everything is a manifestation of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. Fantastic. So even these Hindu deities are a manifestation of compassion, which is actually very important, no matter how you look at it, to see it from that angle. So when you start Shimyo Jango Dedarani Namurada Nadaraya Namakarya Barubija Sebaraya, so far we have said by reciting this magical, mystical, fantastic Dharani, we take refuge in the three precious ones and we vow never to separate ourselves from the mind of Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva. Namak Arya Barogi Jesebaraya. This means we take refuge in Avalokiteshvara and never separate from her. The Swaha means become that. Okay? The rest is from unknown origin plus a bunch of Hindu deities. The Sara Sara Shiri Shiri Soro Soro. We don't know what that is, but it works because comes Mocha Mocha, which means awakening, awakening. So, what we need to understand that the deepest is not rational. Once you have something, you can rationalize it. But what is absolutely clear, that this was from before the Buddha's time. All right? All of them. And they are so powerful, so clear, so much taking you to the right direction and to the point that I believe that the Buddha's disciples and subsequent generations, they said, okay, okay, this teaching on emptiness is great, but can we recite those Dharanis from before? Because they are really efficient to attain emptiness and compassion and wisdom and non-duality and whatever. So I think that's where it's from. And if you do your research plus your practice, research and practice together, it's powerful. Research only is cognition. Practice without knowledge is effort without understanding. You combine the two, you have something. So the great compassion dharani works because it brings your mind to the state of compassion and clarity and awakening. This mind is a very interesting entity. You give an order to it, and if you 100% believe it, you realize it. If you don't believe it, you don't realize it. So the, if you look at the traditional eight levels of yoga, the sixth is dharana. Dharana means keeping one object of mind inside. And the object of mind at its highest form is the dharani, which is giving the right direction to the mind, the right teaching. So all the previous levels serve to strengthen the body, to keep the rules, to do the right thing, to breathe right, to have the right position, to make the energy come back to you, reverse the outflow and come back to yourself, turn the energy inside, and then you can keep the dharani, the single object of mind, which is the right practice, the right focus, and takes you to the upper two realms of jhana, meditation, and samadhi, absorption or oneness. That's a fairly clear system. And the dharanis serve that purpose. That's awesome what's in the two dharanis, because it's a mixture of Mahayana Buddhism and pure Vedanta or Advaita Vedanta, and all the pantheon is there. The Buddhas, the Bodhisattvas, the Hindu deities, the mixed figures. You know, there's one which is a mixture of Vishnu and Shiva. And the name is Hari Hare. That's there in the Korean version too. It's an amazing pantheon. And uh, you don't have to read Carl Gustav Jung to know how the archetypal reality works. It connects to something inside, deeper, and it just does the job. It does the job of becoming clear, having this 
fantastic non-dualistic wisdom and selfless compassion and helpful action as a result. And how complex our mind is, it's clear from the notion that we need so much practice, we need so much work, we need decades of real dedication to bring the best out of yourselves. And still, we have way to go. And that's why these practices are very important. And I really thank our forefathers, our ancestors, our patriarchs, Zen masters, and countless monks, nuns, and lay people that after 2,500 years plus, because 2,500 is just the Buddha, the Hindu tradition goes back another 2,000 at least, maybe more. So that these people did their utmost to bring the Dharma to us, to this moment, to the third decade of the 21st century, to this state of ours, with 7.8 billion people almost, with an earth near collapse, that we still can practice the Dharma, that it didn't disappear. Now, if the practice wasn't so deep and meaningful and transformative, we couldn't do this. It would have been lost a long time ago. Gone with the wind. But we still have something which is really, truly solid rock. And that's why they say, the blue mountain never moves. White clouds go back and forth. Which one do you want to be? It's your choice. I also um, asked the first question. It's still in my head, so I'm breaking two rules. It's not moment by moment, I'm in the past, and I'm checking three times, because this is also checking. Now it's getting very interesting. How can <laughs> I help you? But still, um, uh, you ask me what is uh, the reason of life, or why do I wake up in the morning? I didn't ask about reason. I asked about why you wake yes. up every day. Yes, why I wake up every yeah. day. Yeah. And um, every answer that comes to mind feels like um, it's not complete, or it's too theoretical. Good. So I was wondering if you can give me like a, a pointer to yes. the question. 4 a.m. tomorrow in this Dharma room. That's how you fix it. Just more practice, that's all. Okay. I cannot fix your thinking with more thinking. You have to understand that. More practice necessary, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Easy question. Uh, easy question, I hate it. Go on. <laughs> So sometimes when uh, we sit for meditation or chanting, we're asked to switch places between ourselves. Why is that? Several reasons. One is that sometimes the order gets mixed up and we want to honor the 90-day practitioners, i.e. full-timers, so they could sit in an unbroken order. Okay? But sometimes when we have a lot of incoming people, we need to re rearrange the room in such a way that we have uh, sections of three and two in the center and then the whole thing can change. It's just adaptability and how we arrange the room. That's why we change the seating order. That everybody would have food, visibility, chanting book, whatever. So no, no particular super holy reasons here. Just being practical. That's all. Thank you. So I really want to thank all of you for coming here and practicing together. It's an honor to have uh, many nations and many cultures in one Dharma room. And I sincerely hope that our practice serves this whole world and helps all beings. And if we continue this practicing, then we can make a very positive difference and uh, go towards awakening from ignorance. And that helps us. And that helps all beings. Thank you very much.